I'm really happy to be with you today. I'm Jack Monette, and uh, very thankful to uh, been have been invited here to address you and to hear you uh, and hear some of the concerns that we have. Uh, after listening to Oak, I guess I'm not as subversive as I thought I was, and, uh, and that's good. I know I'm among friends. Obviously, you haven't heard that it takes a village. Uh, <laughs> You know, we were talking, I'm just going to make just a couple of quick comments here, talking about uh, readership and learning styles and so forth. And you go back, and I'm a historian, you go back and you look at the, uh, the history of learning, the history of uh, education, if you go formal education as well as informal education. And you go back to the, particularly the 1820s, 1830s, and we had a very high level of literacy in our country. You mentioned Horace Mann coming in the 1850s. And of course, things changed abruptly with Horace Mann. We found that the, uh, the literacy rate went down. And where we had a Calvinistic approach to education before, there was a good, there was an evil, a right and a wrong. Uh, with Horace Mann, we began to have the Unitarian approach that everything is wonderful. Um, very interesting to go back. I, I found, I, I can recall, when I was at the University of Utah, and I had a, a wonderful professor there in the history of education. And he said that as he would attend various educational meetings, school boards or what have you, he said that as soon as he introduced himself as an educational historian, people stopped listening, that they simply didn't want to hear history. I have found, and I think uh, from Oak's presentation here and others who will be here, that history is really where it's at. I found that in going through the United States, uh, our history of our nation, going through education, virtually the history of anything. If we understand history, we begin to learn a great deal about where we are. And not just where we are, where we've been and the mistakes we've made along the way. And hopefully we can learn from those or be condemned to repeat them. There is a statement, and I don't know how many of you have the, uh, that handout that was originally given. But there is a statement uh, in my notes right at the very top. And it was by Oliver DeMille. And many of you know Oliver. He said, reading Dr. Monette's history of LDS education is like reading a manual for solving modern educational concerns. Could it be that our hardest educational problems were answered by the prophets over a century ago? Now, I personally believe that. Uh, I appreciated the topic that, or the, the way that I was registered to, to give a talk here on original education. That, that's a quite a, an interesting topic. And I thought about that several times, Oak. What is original education? Well, we can go back to scriptures. We can go to some areas there where we have certain revealed principles that have been given to us. And I suspect that would be the original education. What I want to talk about more is a principle that I think is, was the guiding principle in early education. Now, my talk is going to be more or less LDS. And I hope you don't mind. In fact, not more or less. It's going to be more LDS. Um, because. That was the, the area that I worked in a great deal with uh, looking at the foundations of LDS education. And in studying that, I found that so much could transfer to today. And as Oliver had said here, if we simply would have looked at that rather than trying new and improved models along the line, we probably would have a pretty good education system today. We've muddied the water over the years. And the principle I want to talk about in education is the principle of gathering. Now, if you're LDS, you know that's a principle that we believe in. Uh, if you go back to the New York era, the Latter-day Saints gathered to Kirtland, then they gathered to Missouri, they gathered again to, to a Nauvoo, and finally gathered to Utah, meaning that Latter-day Saints stayed together as a group, moving from place to place. It was the only church, to my knowledge, where if you joined a church, you had to move. And so they, they would go and be with one another. And they would grow from that. Well, I have a definition here of gathering. 
and the gathering simply is a homogeneous grouping of like-minded individuals with a similar beginning point and a similar objective. Now, if we look at education in the world today, it's exactly the opposite of that. We try to have the one size fits all. We try to have the, again, no child left behind and such. I'm gonna tell you a personal story. My wife is here, so I'll, I'll use her as the, uh, the object here. But years ago, she was involved in, uh, in a kindergarten program. She's a kindergarten teacher by profession. And with that, you have to understand that we lived in Oregon. Oregon was the last state in the nation to adopt kindergartens. They have a couple of positive things there. Um, it was also our county, Josephine County, in Grants Pass to be the last county in the state of Oregon to adopt kindergarten. So you know we're a little behind the times. She was put over that program and, and she devised the curriculum and so forth and got some things going with it. And then they decided, they brought in a, what we call in our terminology today a change agent. Do you all know what that is? Well, if you don't, that's fine. <laughs> if you do, that's fine too. But they brought someone in uh, to be the superintendent of the school. And she decided that based on some of the things that had happened in that school district in the past, that we were gonna become the model school, the model area for the state of Oregon. And so they decided they would have a K through three classroom and put everybody in one lump together and they wanted to be sure it would succeed. So they had a school and the school was, uh, it had been pretty well left off as a very small school, but it was their own school. And so they were able to have teachers, hand-picked teachers, because they wanted it to succeed. They brought in a half a dozen teachers, and they said, okay, you are gonna teach K through three, and we will show the state how this is to be done. And so back to No Child Left Behind at that time was Goals 2000. And the teachers all got together, and again, they were handpicked, they were good teachers. And they began teaching these students K through three together in the same room. Well, Margie and I were driving at one point and we were discussing that. I have, a, again, a little background in history, and I said, you know that's gonna fail. They've tried that before. That was part of progressive education. You go back, uh, all the way along the line, they'd, they'd made several attempts at bringing this home, uh, the uh, heterogeneous group, grouping in. And so I said, it's gonna fail. And we began talking about some of the reasons why. Well, I have a son, a sharp kid. He's now at Stanford, a tenured professor. So you know, he's a pretty sharp kid. He was sitting in the back seat then. He said, Dad, why are you always so negative? Why can't you be positive? These are good people. They have had a lot of education. They know what they're doing, trust them. And so they began their program. Well, the first year, Oregon is notorious for testing. The first year they tested, and uh, they decided it was just the beginning year so to expect failure, and they failed miserably. The second year, they tested again. And after the testing, they decided not to release the results of the testing. The third year, they tested again and the school was disbanded because in every single case, it was right down at the bottom because they were teaching to the lowest common denominator. It s simply didn't work. It wasn't a homogeneous grouping that we talk about in gathering. Well, let's look at some of this gathering and how that works uh, in LDS education anyway. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 55, there is a scripture talking about selecting and writing books for schools in this church that little children may also receive instruction before me as is pleasing unto me. Uh, William W. Phelps, Oliver Cowdery were in charge of that and they were supposed to come up with some school textbooks. Well, they didn't do it. It didn't work out. They simply had too many other things going on. It never happened until they got to Utah. But it's interesting, in 1831, the Lord would say, get some school books. I don't know how many of you have looked at the old textbooks. Um, that's one of my areas of, of uh, love, I guess. I, I have a collection of old textbooks beginning in the 1700s going forward, and it's really interesting because you can see what's going on in the various school systems. 
You look back in the 1700s, and again, that Calvinistic approach, this is right and this is wrong, and the main objective wasn't necessarily to learn arithmetic or learn languages or anything else. It was to teach right and wrong and go back to your Father in heaven. Again, uh, we have in the 1850s past this point where you get that Unitarian philosophy that everything is rosy. Uh, with the 1831, I've gone back to those 1830 textbooks and I found that even though they were very good, today we would say wonderful, at that time they were not the gathering. We were different. Mormons were different. And the Lord said, you need to have your own textbooks. Those are okay. Those are good. But you have something special and unique. And so you have your own works there to work with. And then we finally come to 1888, and that's a time when the LDS Church in Utah determined they would have their own school system. They had, prior to that time, used district schools, and in the district schools, you had essentially, most towns, small towns anyway, had the bishop as the, uh, uh, the head of the Board of Education there. They had parents on that same committee. They would determine who the instructors would be, and they pretty well oversaw the school. And by the way, when we talk about that, you talk about compulsory education. You know, there's compulsory work in the fields to bring in the wheat harvest and everything else, and that took precedence. So school was kind of secondary to the home and the needs of the home, but school was there. And so you have Wilfred Woodruff primarily, although John Taylor had a great deal to do with it. In 1888, he said, we should have schools where the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Book of Doctrine and Covenants can be used as textbooks and where the principles of our religion may form a part of the teaching of our schools. That's vital. Religious training is practically excluded from the public schools to permit this condition of things to exist among us would be criminal. Does that have transference to today? Let me read that line again. Religious training is practically excluded from the public schools. To permit this condition of things to exist among us would be criminal. Would he give that same statement today? I suspect he would. In Kirtland, you had uh, a large educational coming together of many. We had the School of Prophets, School of the Elders, the Hebrew School, the Kirtland High School. You had many different schools, in fact, in Nauvoo when they originally designed the charter of Nauvoo, one of the first things put in there was the University of Nauvoo in that original charter. It never came to fruition. The saints weren't in Nauvoo long enough, but the point was they were concerned about education. They wanted education. Finally, uh, in 1835 now, and I think you, well, you don't have a full quote there, but Oliver Cowdery was not really over the schools, but he was asked by the prophet Joseph Smith to make a determination of what was happening in the schools in Kirtland. And he wrote this, when the school first commenced, we received into it both large and small. But in about three weeks, the classes became so large and the house so crowded that it was thought advisable to dismiss the small students. Isn't that interesting? We normally think of education for the small students. And yet, Oliver is saying at this point, no. No, we dismiss the small ones so we could teach the adults. Does that make any sense? You know, when I, when I first started going through that, it didn't make sense to me at first. And then I had a wonderful experience with Alvin R. Dyer. Anybody remember him? Remember the first presidency under David O. McKay, when David O. McKay uh, selected additional counselors, then he reverted back uh, as a general authority. And prior, or just following his release from the first presidency, I was going into uh, LDS church education. I had a seminary assignment then, and we were to be interviewed by a general authority. He was the general authority that interviewed me. And through it all, he had just written some books, uh, Refiner's Fire and some other wonderful books. I recommend them very highly. And he had spent some time back in the Midwest. And he came, and again, we had that, that interview. And then he said, now, is there anything you want to ask me? And I was so dumb, I didn't know what to ask. 
And so I just kind of sat there and looked down. And he said, how would you like to teach in the temple? And that got my attention. How would I like to teach in the temple? I didn't know what he was talking about. And so I basically uh, had him say more. And then he said, we have a plat map of the city of Far West. We know what it will be like millennially. And he said, in that plat map, there are 24 temples. Half are Aaronic priesthood temples, half are Melchizedek priesthood temples. And he said, what do you think you do in Aaronic priesthood temples? I don't know. He said, that's where parents learn what they need to learn to teach their children. So when he said, how would you like to teach in the temples? What he was saying was, help parents to understand the responsibility they have to teach their children. And so later on in BYU studies, he makes that statement. And he says, and I think you have a quote there, by the end of the millennium, for those who will occupy the celestial kingdom, the home will be the only medium of teaching children. Teaching will be through the family. That's where we're going. And so when we talk about schools or anything else, what we're really saying is, let's get in this thing, learn it together. I hate the word partnership that's used so much now, that school will partner with parents and so forth. That's not what we're talking about at all. We're talking about parents understanding responsibility. In fact, if you go back to some of the scriptures, and let's, let's hit one at least on this. Um, I love that statement in section 68 of the Doctrine and Covenants talking about the responsibility of parents. Most of you are familiar with the scripture. Inasmuch as parents have children in Zion, you remember that scripture? Inasmuch as they do, that teach them not to understand, and I'm gonna stop there. Oftentimes we look at that scripture and we say, oh, they're supposed to baptize their children or have them baptized and be sure they are confirmed and such. What the scripture is really saying is, teach them to understand. That's the parent's responsibility. So, teach them not to understand the, the doctrine of repentance, faith in Christ, the Son of the living God, and baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands when eight years old, the sin be upon the heads of the parents. Pretty bold. And when we talk about parental responsibility, boy, that really wraps it up. The parental responsibility isn't so much to teach math and science and you know whatever you have it's to teach them how to return to their father in heaven and those things that are vital in that returning and they shall also teach their children to pray and to walk uprightly before the lord and the inhabitants of zion shall also remember the sabbath day to keep it holy and the inhabitants of zion shall also remember their labors inasmuch as they are appointed to labor in all faithfulness and so we have that that main responsibility given to you and I, and that's the umbrella. That's what we oftentimes forget in education. The umbrella is get that child back to his father in heaven. And by the way, there's some other areas here that might help. It's good if he knows how to read, obviously. And it's good if he knows some other things that are important along the way. We're here to gain experience in this earth. But in the process, don't forget the overall reason. And then notice the Lord is also talking about the good things, but he also says there's some problems. There's some negative things that are going on here. He said, now I, the Lord, am not well pleased with the inhabitants of Zion, for there are idlers among them, and their children are also growing up in wickedness. They also seek not earnestly the riches of eternity, but their eyes are full of greediness, these things ought not to be and must be done away from among them. Where do the parents come in? Are the children idle? Are they growing up in wickedness? Are their eyes full of greediness? Two things hit my, my attention automatically as I read this. I remember a comment, first of all, from Spencer W. Kimball, uh, 1941, I wasn't there. But in 1941, he gave his maiden address at a general conference of the church. He had been called to be a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. And he said, in essence, I don't know why the Lord would call somebody like me to the Quorum of the Twelve. 
except that my father taught me how to work. I've thought about that many times. That becomes the key responsibility, doesn't it? To teach working, teach a child what is important as far as that labor is concerned. And then, their eyes are full of greediness. I'm thinking of John Dewey's golden question, what's in it for me? And sometimes we look at education and we say, what do you want to be when you grow up? You go to school, what are you studying for? How much money are you going to make? What we're saying here, if you look at Brigham Young, Brigham said, get all the knowledge you can get. Don't worry about the job. That'll take care of itself. We're here for another reason on the earth. We're here to gain knowledge and become like our Father in heaven. There's a study going on at Stanford right now, and the study has to do with greediness, I think, in the sense that you know, parents for years have said, if my son gets an A, he gets $5. If he gets a B, he gets $3. You've, you've maybe heard that sort of thing before. Stanford is doing that right now with schools and having schools actually write the checks out for the kids. And I thought, greediness? What are we teaching here? Love of learning or love of money? You know, what is it? And hopefully we're teaching a love of learning. That's where it's got to be. And then, here's a great statement. I'm going to kind of wrap up in this area here. But we have, in Utah, in the school system, we had, uh, again, we had district schools in 1888. We had church schools. Interesting thing, in the church schools, we had a very poor atten attendance. 1888 through 1893, you have church schools. And in every every general conference, I think every state conference that I've been able to find, during that period of time, general authorities counseled all the adults to send their children to the church schools. Um, I have a graph, I won't show it to you right now, but it goes downhill. They finally, they, they started about 11% of church members actually sending their children in 1888. That goes down in 1893, we have about 5%, one out of 20 who are actually attending church schools. They can't compete anymore with the district schools. Church schools did things like charge tuition. District schools tried not to charge tuition. Parents said, why should I pay when I can send my kids for free? Do you see a problem there? It's funny, what they pay for, they seem to spend more time with and do better with. Anyway, you have Brigham Young now, and Brigham is, is uh, talking about the district schools and he said, are you going to pay a Gentile teacher for his good looks? And he gets into the whole concept here. If you go back into church history, in the 1880s, late 1880s, uh, we had a number of different churches that came into Utah. And their, their sole responsibility, they felt, was to bring Mormons back into Christianity again and explain what they should have been teaching and learning all the time. And so you had a number of school teachers who had that other mission to teach uh, a gospel-centered curriculum, which was uh, not necessarily Latter-day Saint. So are you going to t uh, pay a Gentile school teacher for his good looks? That's what some of our bishops want to do. If they can get a man, no matter what his moral qualities may be, whose shirt front is well starched and ironed, They'll say, bless me, you're a delightful little man. What a smooth shirt you have got, and you have a ring on your finger. You're going to teach our school for us. And along comes a stalwart man, ax in hand, going to chop wood, and if he asks, do you want a school teacher? Though he may know five times more than the dandy, he's told, no, no, we have one engaged. I want to cuff you bishops back and forth until you get your brains turned right side up. Does that mean somebody who's not LDS can't teach our children? That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is we have a common starting point ourselves as members of the, the LDS church. We have a common goal. We want to return to our Father in heaven. We have a starting point. We're all working together for this. That's the principle of gathering. And when you start to mix ages, you start to mix ideals, where they're going, whether one's uh, in involved in schooling because he wants to grow himself personally from education or one who simply wants to get a job at the end of that, everything becomes very different. 
And so let's get on the same page and we can accomplish much more. Um, I have several statements here from Goodlad also and John Dewey. By the way, John Dewey, um, I had to take a class on Dewey at one time, a graduate class. It's quite an interesting thing. I was forced. But, <laughs> but uh, I learned something about Dewey, just as you mentioned, Oak. Um, Dewey said there are two problems in education right now, two problems in teaching youth. He said the primary problem is they believe in God. They have a preconceived notion of right and wrong. They can't think for themselves. We have to do away with the whole, like, the whole concept of believing in God. And then that allows them to have choices of their own. Well, we believe the parents have some input there also. And then he said, some children have very strong parents, and the parents teach them too much at home. And so as you've said also with, with Goodlad, who said the same thing, we need to be able as parents to, yes, do just exactly that, to be able to speak up and let the schools understand. You remember that phrase in loco parentis? How many of you are, do you have any teachers here? And if you do, I can remember going to uh, my education classes and we learned in loco parentis the, that the school would act in place of the, the parent because the parents gave their permission to do so. Well, unfortunately, parents have thought that I've been abdicated and therefore they'll make those decisions for me. That's not what we want. I'm gonna terminate with this. In that same area, in church education a number of years ago, and by the way, if you want a really interesting thing, if you're concerned, interested at all in church education, look at the life of David O. McKay. David O. McKay was probably the premier educator in the church and did more to influence education in the church than anyone that I know of. David O. McKay was, was a maverick. There was a, a, diff, uh, it was a program at one point and they determined that all the church educators would do better if they have degrees from the East. You know, you should go back to Harvard or MIT or whatever, and then you can come back to Utah with this added knowledge that you have. And so church education said, let's go ahead and take 5% of our salaries, and we'll put it in a fund, and we will then be able to promote teachers going back east. They'll be able to get their, as David O. McKay said, their highfalutin degrees, and they'll be able to come back, and they will be able to share that knowledge with us. Among all the church educators, and at that time, the various academies, and he happened to be principal of the Weber Academy, which is now Weber State College, um, there were over 30 teachers, 29 who said, that's a good idea. One, President McKay, who said that stinks. And he said it does because everything we need is out here. There's a gathering principle we have already gathered we know where we're going, we know what we need, we know what we're doing. We don't have to go somewhere else to have them tell us what to do. Does that sound like modern education today? We get a lot of things from the outside coming in, when in reality, we have a lot of answers right here. Back to, again, that statement by Oliver DeMille that I started with. Could it be that our hardest educational problems were answered by the prophets over a century ago? My answer to that is a resounding yes. We don't need to have a lot of things coming from the outside. It was so simple, and we have complicated a very simple thing. So again, I appreciate being able to be here and share these things with you. Let me end with one note. Neil Flinders pointed something out years ago that has stayed in my mind. It was a statement by John Taylor, and he said, someday the saints would be as far ahead of the world in matters pertaining to education as they were in those pertaining to religion. Think about that. We have a lot to offer, and we need to offer it, and not simply be on the receiving end, but on the giving end. So with that, I'll terminate. And, uh, if, does anyone have any questions? Yes. You know, what happened to church schools, I think is what you're saying, 
And, and if you look at that, by 1893, you have district schools, uh, like public schools today, well-funded, tremendously well-funded. They were paying teachers up to $100 a month. Uh, Latter-day Saints were paying their teachers about $50 a month, but, f but half of that was in script, which means you went to, went to the bishop's storehouse and got food, and you, you hoped the, the students would pay their tuition to get the rest of your pay. And unfortunately, they pretty well died out because of that. They, they simply couldn't afford to keep things going. Now, David O. McKay again steps in, and he's called to be a general authority. In 1906, he's called to be a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. And he's the main educator among the group, and he's told at that point, not right then, but a little later, he said, we can't maintain these church schools, what can we do? His idea was, all right, because we have so, many, so much public schooling come in that, coming in now, we can't compete in schools, but we can educate the teachers. And so you have uh, down at Ephraim, Snow College was an old uh, academy. Uh, Dixie was an old academy. Weber was one of the older academies. Logan was one of the older academies. All those became schools with teacher colleges. And the idea was we would have Latter-day Saint teachers going into the public schools teaching. That was to be kind of the, the bridge that worked for about 20 years. And then after that time, we lost that, uh, that momentum, and so we don't have the LDS teachers that we used to have. But we tried to maintain it, but it was simply too costly. It wouldn't work without support from the Latter-day Saints. Yes? I yeah, yeah. You know, that's one of the most frustrating things as you go through it. And I, again, I've got the diagrams on it. It just makes you sick when you have these, all these general authorities standing up in conference and saying, send your children to church schools and you have such a small percentage doing that. They did it for a couple of reasons. Number one, the public schools were better funded so they had better apparatus facilities. Teachers were better paid so they had some pretty good school teachers. They were free schools where we charged tuition. And all those things together were kind of working against the church and forming their own system. Consequently, you have this huge number going to the other schools. We then worked with the seminary system. We worked with uh, religion classes, if you will, after school, trying to somehow bridge that gap, but it never really worked. It never was fulfilled. Yes? Yeah, uh, free schools. And there, there's a wonderful article called Free Schools Come to Utah, and people were, were strapped, let's face it, uh, even more so than today. You have a Mormon with 10 kids, and they have tuition to pay, and that became quite a bill. So when you have now free schools, and they really weren't free, you still had to buy textbooks, but they were free as far as tuition was concerned. And, and if you couldn't pay, then the state would come in and fill in for you. So, uh, Yes. The clause itself in the Constitution about free schools, yeah, there was a lot of impetus from uh, mainly from the educators that came to Utah from that Eastern background, definitely. Okay. Yes. Uh, how do you see the seminaries and the institutes uh, fill, filling in this area? What about seminaries and institutes filling in? They've certainly tried, and frankly, they've made a pretty good approach. However, when you have students for um, one period a day and the other five or six periods, they're often in the school building learning other things. Oftentimes, as a seminary teacher, I used to have to reteach some of my students, and that, that's always kind of a conflict. They go to a science class, they come to you, and they say, well, evolution is real. And so then you have to sit down and say, well, not necessarily because. And so it's, it really isn't fair to the student in many ways because they're getting two different points of view where in an academy situation, the, you would mingle scriptures, always scripture and always words of the prophets with those educational subjects being taught. Much different approach. Yes.
Good, good point. And that's the, over, that's the umbrella that we hope people look at. That, that's the, the primary thing. Again, the academia is good, but if that's all we're concerned about, we've lost it. We haven't brought that child back to his father in heaven. About two or three more, yes. <laughs> That's a book that I wrote about 15 years ago. It's called Revealed Educational Principles and the Public Schools. And it was, uh, it was my dissertation that I did at the U, and then Margie and I spent a year in China. If you ever want to write a book, go to China. There's nothing to do when the sun goes down. And so there was, uh, was a lot of writing time, and uh, was able to put that into a format, a book format. And if we had time, I'd tell you about the history of that book. It's been interesting. It sold several thousand copies. And it's just interesting in the sense that when people realize what it was versus what it is, there's a big difference. Sometimes we just look at what we have today and we assume it's always been that way. It has not. So, okay, thank you very much.